Hey everybody, thanks for joining us this morning for the second part of our Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Workshop series on soil health. Today we're going to be talking about the living soil and some cover cropping, soil health management, and mulching and no-till. Before we get too far into today's topic, I just want to pause and offer a land acknowledgement. Many of us, myself included, are farming on unceded Abenaki territory and just want to offer a moment to reflect on that and also just say that it's hard not seeing everybody this winter and um, hope you all are doing well. Look forward to seeing everyone in person again soon. So today we're going to get going with um, starting out with Silas Branson talking about cover crop rotations for nutrient management and then Andrew from Clearbrook Farm is going to talk about his soil fertility management at Clearbrook Farm in Shaftesbury, followed by Ryan from Evening Song Farm, uh, who's been trying some small scale no-till techniques and finally ending with Spencer Blackwell um, from Elmer Farm in East Middlebury, who has some innovative mulching techniques. So really packed lineup. We've got 15 minutes of talking followed by five minutes of questions. So please type your questions into the chat. And if you um, are listening to this as a recording, please complete an evaluation. Um, I can post a link to that on the Veg and Berry listserv, but please complete that. It's really helpful to us. So I'm going to hand it over to Silas, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Silas. Fied, organic. Um, it's about 35 acres of tillage. 20 of those are in cash crops in any given year, give or take and 10, maybe a little bit less in full season cover. And then we have five-ish that are other little bits right at the ends of, ends of rotation blocks, harvest lines, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're very sandy soil, um, pretty dry, pretty hot. Uh, and we are high phosphorus in almost all of our fields. Um, everything on the east side is is high phosphorus. So it's just that, that one little chunk that's out west that we can put, you know, higher phosphorus fertilizers, manure, that sort of thing on. So really briefly, just the way we manage our crop rotation as much as we can is to try to split things up into one acre blocks and then build our field plan to fill those one acre blocks, you know, so whatever the beets and carrots go together and then we jam the chart in there to try to fill up that block because it's always a little bit shy or whatever it is, right? So we're just trying to re reduce the number of management units that we have, um, which simplifies things. Um, as we'll get to a little bit later, I think it also sometimes can lead to more unutilized space, um, which is a little bit of a balance. Uh, so yeah, how the cover crops fit into rotation, pretty basically, right? Like the cash crop that's in there previously is going to determine what you can put in next. So depending when a given crop, cover crop comes out, you're going to have different options, right? Your choices are different for the early broccoli that comes out in June, July than they are for the late broccoli that comes out in October or September or whatever it is. Um, so that's sort of the start of the decision tree. And then from there, um, we look at the options that we have given the time of the year um, and at that point, we want to know what's going to happen next in that field. So we'll do a loose rotation midsummer, um, and that lets us know, right, when we need to plant the following year and what's going to be going in and what its needs are as far as weed control and fertility and, and yada, yada, yada. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. I just want to acknowledge that there are obviously lots of other things that go into the rotation planning. We're sort of focused on cover crops and fertility today, but there are lots of other considerations, right? Pest and disease pressure matter, moving to the ground, weed pressure. We have plenty of weed pressure everywhere, but some fields that are really particularly bad and we know that we don't want to put all our direct seeded carrots or something in that field um, because it's hard to harder to cope with things there. Um, we also have a pretty variable flood risk depending on what field we're in. They all have some flood risk, but some of them have a lot more. Um, so we want to be careful about what we think we're going to plant in April in some of those fields or 
how many things that are really critical to us we're putting in fields that are at higher risk of getting wiped out. Um, as far as our goals, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, we want to capture the remaining nutrients, right? We're using a lot of slow release fertilizer. And so there's plenty of plenty of N and other stuff left at the end of the year that um, hasn't been made available to crops yet. So we want to get something down that's going to soak that up so that we don't lose any more of it than we have to. We want to hold the soil in place. We want to grow as much biomass as we can to try to maintain our organic matter. As I said, we're very sandy and we don't haven't had any luck really growing our organic matter. So we're sort of running as fast as we can to try to tread water. Um, so all the biomass we can get in there, we want to, to uh, try to at least keep our organic matter where it is and hopefully someday be able to build it. Um, we want to suppress weed growth so that we're not Right, not just field cultivating over and over and over again on bare ground. Um, and then we want to grow nutrients for future crops, primarily nitrogen. Um, so I'm going to run through the basic cover crops we use. I would say that our practices are, I don't know, there's nothing particularly innovative at, about them. They're, they're I think, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so I'll just run through quickly sort of what we do and what the roles are. Um, so we've sort of got two buckets of cover crops. First is the non-legumes. Um, we use a lot of winter rye, right? Winter rye we use for things that are going to overwinter for the most part, um, as opposed to the oats that we'll put in um, where we want things to winter kill, either where we're going to plant early the following year or where we're going to um, turn it in and put something else in that same year. We occasionally use Sudan grass um, when we have like a, a little a summer window and we want to put on as much biomass as quickly as possible. And it's pretty good at that, uh, but it's more of a, a niche thing for us mostly. It's winter Ryan oats in combination with various legumes. Um, so again, hairy batch is, I'm sure the the legume that we put the most of in, you know, it goes in in a mix, um, you know, August planted, September planted, that sort of thing. Usually with rye or definitely with rye, we sometimes do a rye oat batch mix um, just to reduce the amount of living biomass that we have to deal with the following year. Um, and we've had decent success with that. When we get it well established, it seems nice. Uh, we have had it a couple times where, you know, the germination at seeding was a little bit spotty and then the oats died off and it was a little bit thinner than we would want it to be for weed suppression the following April, May. Um, but often that can be, that can be helpful because, right, as you all know, with a rye batch that you're trying to incorporate in a hurry in the third week of May, it can be a lot of biomass to try to chew up and turn around to get to a any sort of bed preps that you like for planting or seeding. Um, peas, we use largely in combination with oats um, for single season windows. And that can be either at the beginning of the year, you know, trying to get something in in April uh, and get some biomass and a little hit of nitrogen before a late planted crop, or it can be something going in you know, mid season that then winter kills um, and you have some biomass and nitrogen there and a, a dead easy to incorporate residue uh, for the following season. And then we use some clovers mostly in situations where we have full, full year on a field, right? Those, those 10 or I think it's usually a little bit less than that acres of a field that are in year round cover crop. Um, we generally do the clovers in a mix um, between the red and red and yellow. Um, the red gets established a little bit faster, uh, and so the weed suppression is a little bit better. Um, we'll also usually put in um, an oat or something like that with it. So if we seed it in August of the year, we'll put in an oat, red clover, sweet clover mix, uh, and then the oats will die off over the winter. But in the meantime, they have provided some weed suppression early on as the clovers are getting going. 
And then ideally the following year you have like a, a nice well-established red clover, yellow clover mix. Um, and you can mow that a couple times over the course of the year to encourage the, the red in particular to tiller and fill in some more. Um, so we use those two on year round cover crop and have reasonable results. I feel like the challenge there is, is the weed control, um, right? Getting them clean enough that we can leave them without it being a problem later on. Um, the all side clover we use just every now and then, um, it's more moisture tolerant. Um, it does a little bit better in, in wet soil. And so we'll use it sometimes in a mix with the red anyway. Um, in some of our lower, more flood prone fields in the hopes that if we get a winter flood or a spring flood, we won't end up with the big dead zones that we sometimes do. Um, but that again is more of a niche thing for us. Um, all right, so I'll run through a couple of quick examples just to sort of show sort of the three, three or four primary ways that we try to grow nitrogen in our rotation. Um, and the main thing here is year two, we've got um, right, early beets and carrots going in mid-April. Uh, they're gonna come out July, August and the rye batch can go in sometime late August. Um, we can see rye batch and have it do okay most years up through the third week of September. It's probably varies for y'all as we're in a pretty warm spot. Um, so yeah, the rye batch can go in August, September and then get established over winter, come back the following year. And then we are able to let it, let it grow through middle, third week of May, something like that. And then mow it and till it in for a late planted crop. In this case, it's sweet corn. So I think that, that that's the most common nitrogen growing setup that we have. Um, and it's pretty effective, you can get a lot of a lot of nitrogen out of a, a nice mature batch crop, so it's a that's a winner for sure. Um, and then the second example is more of the oats and peas. Um, so in this example, in year two, we have brassicas going in early and then coming out July or you know into August, something like that. Um, and then we're putting in oats and peas mid August and letting them letting them go until they frost kill um, so that we get some biomass and nitrogen, but then have a nice dead residue to, uh, to go and do the following year. The other thing we'll do with oats and peas is put it in early in the year and then till it in before, uh, before a late planting crop of, I don't know, late brassicas or something like that. Uh, the third example is sort of the, the year round cover crop option um, that I gave earlier uh, in year one, the red clover, yellow clover goes in. Uh, and then year two, you have the red clover, yellow clover mix um, all year. Uh, the red clover will tiller. You can kill yellow clover if you mow it at full bloom. Um, we have also sometimes left it longer and then mowed it and tried to get it to sell seed a little bit more. If we're going to continue leaving a field and cover crop, you know, beyond that first year, um, you can try that and see if you can get it to reestablish um, so that you maintain your mix that way. But typically we'll, you know, we'll start mowing it sometime in June and mow it a couple times, um, basically depending on what the weed pressure is like in there um, and hopefully get a nice thick carpet going and then incorporate it in the following year. Um, one thing with clover that we try to keep in mind, um, thanks to Becky tell, telling us about it, uh, is that the availability is going to vary depending when you're tilling the clover in in the year. And so if you're tilling it in April or early on, most of the biomass is in the in the roots and is gonna is a little bit woodier and not gonna release that fast. So the nitrogen that's there is probably not gonna be particularly available early on. And then as you get later and later and the soil warms up and you have more 
more of the biomass in, in the more lush top growths, um, that nitrogen is going to be available a little bit faster. Um, so if we have a clover field that we're taking out in sections as we do our succession planting, we'll usually like have a graduated set of steps of how many, how much nitrogen credit we're counting that clover for as the year progresses. Um, I'll run through really quickly some of the stuff we're using. Again, it's pretty basic stuff. We've got a case grain drill. The one thing I would say about this is that a few years ago, we got this grain drill that has the press wheels in the back that you can see a little bit there. And we've had much better results getting solid stand establishment, um, especially in summer, right? As I said, we're sandy, we're hot, we're dry, and we have tended to have bad germination on, on cover crops in the summer. Um, and the press wheels have really helped with that, which make, can make a big difference in a hurry um, trying to grow nitrogen since, right, in, in large part, those August seedings, when it's inclined to be hot, are when you're putting in the vetch or the oats, oats and peas or whatever it is, it's gonna grow nitrogen for you. So um, it's been nice having more of those uh, turn out for us. Um, and so it's such a shame to put that in and then have it be too spotty and you decide to till it in. But at that point, it's too late to put it in batch. So you end up with just rye and then you're, right, you're soaking up the, the old nitrogen that was there, but you're not adding any more. So definitely the press wheels have been a good investment for us. Um, we're to incorporate you know, fuller cover crop residues. We have a couple of flowers that we use. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. I think definitely this seemed to accelerate breakdown versus a brush hog. So I would recommend getting one. I would recommend, we have a wood max and I would recommend not getting a wood max. Um, it rattles apart a lot. It's cheaper, but I think I would go for arrears or something, one of the higher end models because Seems like it's probably more headache than, than we saved on it. Um, we do have a spader that we use, a Tortella spader. Um, it does, again, a nice job of incorporating stuff. Um, you can see a more standard use case there where we've mowed beforehand. Um, yeah, it does a nice job incorporating stuff. It is incredibly slow, you know, like five or six hours an acre probably more like six. Um, and it's it's really expensive to maintain. There are a ton of moving parts and bearings on that thing. Um, I think it probably cost us, I don't know. I did I did the math a couple of years ago and it was over $200 an hour to operate it. I think that's going down as we've gotten better at maintaining it. We've changed some of the ways we use it and some of the ways we maintain it and, and our bearing burn rate seems to have gone down, but it's still, it's expensive and it's slow. Um, but I do feel like it buys us close to a week of decent turnaround time, um, you know, compared to chiseling and disc harrowing. Um, so it's, uh, we try to pick our spots with it, but it's, it's useful to have in our toolbox. I do, I'm curious about the high speed discs that, uh, Seems like people are getting into. They seem like they do do a pretty good job with, with residue and turning things around. Um, and then I'll just quickly mention that we do have an old combine um, that we use. So we try to target an acre or two for that um, over over the course of the season. So that's just one other thing that we're doing with, you know, a pe one or two rotation blocks every year. It's letting that run mature and then combining it for mostly rye seed. Sometimes we can get a rye vetch blend, um, but usually it's just, just straight rye. So, and a couple things that, in that regard that I've been thinking about that feel like things that we could do better or that I, yeah, that I'd like to improve on. Um, going back to the beginning, I was surprised in putting this talk together that we have that like a whole five acres, that's, that's basically unplanted ground. 
you know, and I think a lot of that is the edge of a rotation block, right? If our rotation block isn't quite a full acre, but we're putting it in a one acre block, um, then, uh, then the rest of that will usually just, you know, we'll field cultivate it for the period that that crop is in there and then seed it with everything else at the end. Uh, and we've also moved to putting in more, more harvest lands here and there, which has definitely definitely has benefits from a labor efficiency standpoint and like a quality of life standpoint, right? None of us miss hauling tubs of corn out sideways through eight beds to the edge of the block or whatever or whatever. But it does is it's more land than I than I had thought it was. And so I was trying to think about ways that we could incorporate more of that either by getting some more cover crops in those zones. I know some people have been doing like clover, clover strips, um, which seems great. I wonder with our weed pressure, right? Like if we could get a clover strip established without it just becoming a pit of weeds, um, you know, but maybe we could do, right? Like an oak clover or something and then mow off the oats or a rye clover or something and mow off the oats at some point in the season um, or, you know, I know some people are broadcasting red clover onto rye and then mowing that off. And I wondered about, uh, doing that and then just making sure that we only till up the ground that we need for planting so that we can preserve a little bit there. Um, so just trying to use a little bit more of that. And the question there of course is, how much complexity we want to try to add to what we're trying to do, right? Because there is a balance there of, okay, well, what's the benefit and how much effort is this going to take for us to realize that benefit and how far, just how far down the rabbit hole that we want to get there. Um, and then the other thing, you know, one thing I talked about a little bit earlier um, is that we sometimes have trouble establishing our summer cover crops and we definitely end up waiting for the rain. Um, we have solid set aluminum irrigation, uh, which, you know, we have some bigger guns that can cover a big chunk, um, but they're a pain to move around. Um, and I was curious about using something like a traveler, if that would be an easier method um, for us, just to make it feasible for us to irrigate an acre or two of ground that we wanted to seed to cover crop if we, if we really weren't gonna get the rain. Um, just to give us the chance to get those nitrogen fixing cover crops in at the right time to maximize their productivity. Uh, and then the other thing that I feel like hampers our nitrogen growing efforts is weed control because we end up losing parts of plantings or entire plantings um, to weeds, you know, like our clover blocks more often than not will end up tilling in two beds on each edge and 10 feet at, at each end um, because we get, get weed incursion or we'll end up dishing a whole section because it's sort of interspersed with, with stuff going to seed. Um, and so I'm curious about what the things are that, that we could do um, to try to get, to be able to keep more of the cover crop that we see. Um, I don't know, you know, it seems like maybe you could flex time um, early on once or twice and get some of that little stuff before it gets established. And I thought it might make a big difference. Um, so if people have experiences with that, I'd be really curious to hear about it um, because that does feel like another big area where we can improve both our, both our ability to, to grow cover crop and nitrogen, but also um, our ability to not grow weed seed. So and yeah, and that's the end of my thing. So I don't know, we have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and there's my email if you want to follow up about anything. Thanks, Silas. That's a lot of great information. Um, you have a couple questions. One is what are the benefits of yellow clover over red? And I, I think Spencer's also going to talk a little bit about that, but um, if you can just say why you're choosing yeah. clover. Yeah, the, the yellow clover, it establishes more slowly. So that's not a benefit, um, right? The red gets going better. Uh, the yellow is deeper rooted. Um, 
and you get more biomass out of it in the second year. Um, so we like having the mix in there for the red to get going earlier. And then the second year, um, the yellow uh, is sort of more prominent and we get more biomass out of it. And hopefully we get some penetration down, down through. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, have you tried planting squash directly into the clover? I think this is when you're talking about your rotation. After yeah. rolling rather than tilling into the clover. We haven't tried doing it directly into clover. We did um, the UVM extension strip um, strip till, uh, zone till rather, trial a few years ago with winter squash into rye um, and had sort of middling success. Uh, but yeah, we haven't tried the clover. Um, I'd definitely be curious about that. I don't know, like are people using a zone tiller kind of set up for that or just like ripping, ripping one shank down there or... I don't know how, how folks are doing it, but yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I've seen it more as like a um, in-between rows, so you'd still cultivate oh, yeah. the squash, but I don't, I, I imagine on a smaller scale, you could no-till plant right into it, which. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I guess, the, you know, the thing we have done is when we have a clover, an established clover, we'll just till the beds that we need and then leave the blank beds, like we did that in between all, are like zucchini and, and melons on, um, on plastic last year. And that worked really well because we want harvest lanes there and they can buy that out over the clover and we can drive through with the wagons on the clover. Um, so that's nice when we have it. But again, it takes a while to get that clover going to a point where it's really suppressing weeds. Um, so it's nice to have yeah, it there when you can. I would just mention too that red clover is pretty um, high growing and would need mowing. So interplanting into that would be challenging. White clover is definitely a better, um, Dutch white clover, probably a better crop for that. Um, last question I think is, um, why have you decided not to use buckwheat or annual ryegrass? Oh yeah, we, um, let's see, buckwheat is something I, think we'll think about maybe using more in those um in some of those blank zones just to just to stick some some biomass in uh i would say mostly we haven't used it in for simplicity um you know because we're waiting for big blocks and then when we have a big block uh but we you know we would rather get it into a legume or something like that um, and so I feel like buckwheat could be one of the, one of the good options for the little chunks. Um, but usually when we have a whole acre or something like that, we want to, we want to get it into something else. Great. Um, there are some interesting comments fodder for a conversation, but I'm going to move on and invite Andrew to share the screen. Thank you so much, Silas. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. Um, that was really interesting, Silas. That was really cool, great photos, and um, I'm really interested in yellow clover. Um, we'll, uh, our farm is down in the southwest corner in Shaftesbury, um, near Bennington, south of Manchester. Um, we grow about 25, more like 30 acres of veggies now. We used to grow some more and I cut back. Um, we have about 45 acres tillable. And um, some of that land we use uh, for rye straw, uh, about five, five acres every year lately for our strawberries and other things. Um, and then the other, we do some summer cover cropping and prep for the next year. And so what I'm gonna talk about is, you know, we're not, we have a farm stand that's open every day. We, we try and provide a lot of stuff all the time. And so, um, we use our land in a way that's, um, you know, it, it's, it, we can't just do, it's not like us, we don't have quite like the CSA where if we had, you know, a lot of shares, we could just do a block of carrots here, you know, three blocks of carrots. I mean, we could probably do that, but we don't, we sort of mix our greens and sort of small crops and we have blocks of other things all mixed around. So, but, it, but we try and move, we have three fields, each is like a mile apart 
And they're sort of different sizes, the home farms in the middle. So north about three quarters of a mile and south, I guess about three quarters of a mile. There's a, there's a field in each direction. Um, and uh, so it's great for some rotations of bugs, at least potato bugs. <laughs> we can get far enough away that they can't walk down the route 7A and get to the next field. So that's been lucky. But um, the other thing is our soil is not naturally fertile. We're at about 1,100 feet. It's gravelly. This is our section of field where it's sandy. Maybe half half of this greenhouse towards us, you know, sort of halfway down the field towards us is sort of sandy with not too many rocks. And then everything to the north is gravelly. We have another field that's both our other fields are more um, silty or loamy, but with a you know a fair number of rock, quite a lot of rocks. We rock pick and have a rock picker and all that stuff. Um, well, we had a rock picker but the rocks did it in. Um, so yeah, so that's how we, how we, you know, that's what we're working with and try and fit things into that. Um, I'll just before I'm, yeah. So uh, initially, you know, oh, we've been at this spot 20, this will be our 27th season. We used to just spread composted manure and there were dairy farms around and we could get composted, you know, just get cow manure and spread it and everything was, was cool. Um, we, we don't do that anymore, but, um, our home farm had a lot of manure spread on it. And that's only like right now we, because of greenhouses and other things, we're down to maybe eight acres tillable on the home farm and the rest of our lamb, our tilled lamb is in the other two fields. Um, so we, you know, we used to do, like I was saying manure and we also do a lot. We used to just do like rye, or, you know, winter rye in the winter. And that was sort of our cover crop rotation. Occasionally, we we throw in some hairy vetch in the early two thousands, you know, or late, you know, but it wasn't. We weren't really focused on their cover crops, and um, we used a lot of jeruz back then. Once we got away, once the dairy farm started going going away, um, and so we bought in some jeruz chicken as well, um, and that was sort of a pretty basic fertility regime, but now things have, have changed. Um, so um, we really do like to do cover cropping, but once again, you know, we're sort of fitting our cover cropping. We get to it when we get to it, but our goal is to have, have um, you know, is, is our cash crops and trying to keep our farm stand supplied. Um, but we do, we generally, I don't really get seeding the bare ground. I mean, I try and keep the winter covers as long as I can, and then we mow them with a flail mower and plow them in. Um, but, uh, you know, starting in June, it's like, I, we also have a bedding plant business. So things are just kind of for everybody, whatever your farm is, I'm sure May is always, the, it's just super busy. But starting in June, we can start thinking about and getting cover crops in. Um, and, um, one thing is we do try and seed our roadways and we use annual rye with our box seeder. And I'll show you a picture if we get to it. Of a, we just have an old McCormick, like 1940s box seeder uh, someone gave me years ago. And um, it works great. And we love doing, um, we love doing annual rye uh, roadways. It's, it's just, and then when we cover crop, we just leave the annual rye. Sometimes we'll spin something over it or We'll try and till it in and it just comes it survives the winter it's a it's a great for me it's a great roadway um we mowed a few times a year uh you can see here we mulch with straw on the edge of those tomatoes but um now we uh, use weed mat and i like to seed the rye i like to seed the roadway and then put the weed mat down so that um we don't have an interface without a crops and there's times when we don't do that and then there's always this weedy um, vein between the cover crop or between the roadway and the um, and the plastic mat so for a while we were doing some seeding in between uh, onions and some other crops we don't do that anymore it just was too difficult for me to manage um, our, you know like I said our fields we have to you know, put the mower in the back of the pickup, drive it up somewhere, mow it, not hit too many rocks. It just, I just wasn't very good at it. Um, it's great if you, if for those who can manage it, it's, it's amazing. I, I've seen some great, great 
management of this, but it just doesn't work for me. It's too much to manage time wise. Uh, so here we have, um, <clears throat> so there's some clover on the left that was seeded. Uh, actually that was seeded over some corn. So the year before we had some sweet corn and when it was just the last cultivation, I threw some red clover over it with just a hand spinner and, um, and then mowed off the corn and that's what we got. It was, pretty, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. On the right there was just some rye grass from whatever the crop was next to it. I think it was strawberries there and we had put some rye in. Um, and so, and you can see the rye looks a little weak. Um, our, our, like I said, our natural fertility is pretty low. So a crop, oftentimes our crops suck up whatever nitrogen there is and there's not a lot left over. Um, this field had the previous year, this was tomatoes. And so one of the, and I'll get, I'll show you some mixes later, but one of the things uh, I did on this, our cover cropping is like, well, whatever I've got in the barn for seed, I'll make a cover crop even in midsummer. So I think this roadway had been like oats, uh, oats, peas, and some clover. And the oats and peas kind of survived the year while we were, uh, you know, had this had the tomatoes in there uh, and the roadways were oats, peas, and clover. And then uh, we took the tomato, you know, and then the tomatoes came out. We put some, I think we put, I think that's us. I think we seeded that in the spring. I can't remember. Sorry, but that's. I think we. I think we have oats there that we're mowing in now, and in between are the roadways left over from the previous year, the red clover, and we'll just end up mowing it, and then we'll plow the whole block. Um, so this is sort of more. Uh, another thing we do, like I said, it's just what you know. I mean, I I do think about. I do think a little bit about what we want to put in, but the things I really like for uh, spring seeding are oats and peas. I love Japanese millet. That's a real favorite of mine. Um, and vetch. So this is all seeded on June 7th. Um, two weeks later, it's what it's looking like. We used our box seeder. Um, you can see the rates there. Um, there's something in there's a little thing on my screen, so I can't see what <laughs> what all the rates are, but I think it was a sixth each for millet and vetch and uh, peas and oats, and then 18 pounds of red clover per acre. Um, and I just mixed it all up and had the clover in the clover box. And so then if you, then the next, you can sort of see what it looks like. That was the, that was the, a close up at that same time as the other, um, as the other photograph. So June 21st, but then by July 12th, it's looking like this on the right. And um, that's what it looked like by July 15th from a distance, you know, we were back up. It was about a foot tall. Um, that picture earlier with, the, with the, my employee standing in the field was a little bit later uh, in the year, maybe like July 25th. Um, so it, it's, you know, I like that's a nice summer crop. I've been using that a lot lately. Uh, any mix of that. Um, so this is Sudex and millet. You can see the rates there and medium red clover again, seeded around, I don't remember it was the 27th, 25th. It was sort of late, late June. And this photo was, um, whatever that says uh, there, uh, the 8th, 9th of, of August. And I'm mowing it now and it's about that tall. And it was really interesting in this field, um, in the talk that Becky gave, the presentation last week that was given, someone said how sensitive um, Sudan grass is to uh, nitrogen and it really needs nitrogen. In this field, you could just see where the nitrogen was and where it wasn't. Of course, I took a photo where it was because it looked really cool, but there's other spots where, you know, it was probably half that height and not nearly as robust. And, um, and that was, and that was where there was no low nutrient. And, you know, it's fine. I was glad to put the cover in there and, you know, didn't put any fertilizer on the, you know, on the cover crop it was, but it was really um, telling what we had. And then like, so 11 days after that, that was, I was mowing. And then 11 days later, this is the clover that was being, that was nursing underneath 
and, and so that I, the photo I didn't get was when I first seeded it for the first few weeks, the millet actually was was over the Sudan grass. So the millet was kind of doing its thing. And then the Sudan grass overtook them. I think I mowed it once other time, the millet got knocked back, the Sudan grass came up and then I mowed the Sudan grass and this was the clover. And that was a great crop. It did pretty well over the winter. It was a, it was a weird winter and so we lost some of that clover, but it still filled in the next spring, but we ended up having to plow it. It was really, I was really interested in that, uh, what Silas mentioned that Becky had mentioned about waiting longer on your clover to get more nutrient. Cause we generally, I generally have been plowing our clover pretty early and it is, it's a lot of like heavy roots. And then we end up spending a lot of time waiting for those roots to break down before we plant. And I wonder, Maybe if I just waited longer, another few weeks and get more growth, maybe the roots wouldn't be so fibrous as well. I don't, I don't know, but um, but I do love growing clover. It's just, you have to give it some time. I've had to give it some time after we plow it under. And, and we, we do use a chisel plow now and again, but mostly I'm old school and we use the mold board and I realize it's got problems. We do have a subsoiler. We run through there occasionally, um, but yeah. Uh, See, and, and I don't think a spader would work on all our rocks. I think that would become a very expensive proposition. Yeah, thanks, Silas. <laughs> I've thought about it, and then everyone says, "Don't bother." So, um, and here's a millet, oat, clover, and a few peas. This was seeded mid June. Once again, that's when we get to stuff. This is, you know, I would have mowed this earlier. You can see the millets in uh, is in seed head there. I don't think the seeds. Some of those seeds were mature. Most weren't. Um, but uh, I would have mowed it earlier. It was just a really wet August. I think this was three, two or three years ago. We just had a killer August. It was just so much rain and that was a really wet summer. Actually, I think that's when everyone else, Silas was probably in the middle of a drought and anybody up north, north of Rutland, but we were just getting rain every single day. I mean, it was crazy, um, but it grew a nice cover crop, so. So that's what we see, you know, it's, it's 10 feet wide, it's pretty funky, um, but it works. I would, I love the idea of those packing wheels. Um, this has some chains behind that kind of throw some dirt around. Uh, it's got two boxes. Um, I, I'm kind of, I, I have an affection for this bot, for this cedar. So I don't think I'll, I mean, at some point I might do something else, but I just like it because it's funky and, um, I, yeah, it's cool. And we, we don't seed everything with that. Um, I don't know, maybe I can show this. So it's just, that's, you know, it's Becca again, she's, she tends to do our box seeding. Um, but that was, this was filmed on a very old, old iPhone many years ago, but I took a moment to film something back then. I don't do that too much anymore. So, um, so that's the box seeder. And then we do use a, we have a slightly bigger cone seeder now, but really not much bigger and we, we spend a lot of spend a lot of acreage of, of cover crop out uh, what we generally use this for is more in the fall when we have a whole block um, we'll use especially for rye oats peas anything large seeded it's pretty easy and it's just a little time consuming sometimes and then we disc it um, most of the time consuming part is just filling the hopper um, so that's I guess I'll stop there on my cover cropping. If this is okay, Becky, I don't know if, but I was just gonna give a little brief overview about our other fertility. So cover crops give us a certain amount of fertility, but I don't count just with our soil. I just don't count on it to grow our crops. Um, I will say one of the things I love to do is uh, if we have a great crop of vetch, uh, and we can hold on to it. I love vetch before fall brassicas. It does a, it just always seems to do a great job. And same with, I try and do peas and oats before our fall brassica field. So whatever is going to be in fall brassicas, that's something I, it gives me, I have enough time, whether it's in vetch or I do make a point early on of putting some peas and oats in. I don't wait till June for fall brassicas, but I do like to get a nice cover crop in. And um, yeah. So uh, the other main part of our fertility is crares. We don't get jurus anymore. And I just, this is, this is totally anecdotal, but on the field that we started farming when we 
we are of our three fields, the uh, our third field, um, we started farming maybe well, 12 or 14 years ago, and we'd switched to crares from Jeru's. And part of the impetus for that was it was very expensive to truck these truckloads full of Jeru's from upstate New York to southern Vermont when we could get one tractor trailer load from crares and get all the fertility needs met, basically, without having to have like five truckloads drive from northern New York. And I just thought about the, you know, a little bit about carbon footprint. I don't know. I probably there's other things with how Crayers is made that maybe offset that, but um, just in general. And then the ease of spreading Crayers. But my anecdotal thing is wherever we put Jeru's, we have high, high phosphorus. And we've been spreading Crayers on, on some land for 12 or 15 years, and our phosphorus is really manageable. It's low. And there's some, I, I don't know if it's true, and I've talked to Becky about this, but there's something about Jeru's that are that wet uncompost, I don't know, that the phosphorus just seems higher in that. Or maybe I just couldn't control how much because it's you need such a small amount and our manure spreader was rather like a shotgun approach, maybe just puts too much on. And uh, I know up north, Jeru's will spread for you. They don't spread this. They won't come down with their spreader truck. And anyway, so and what the other thing I like about this, the crares is I can put it on. And it was really interesting to learn that crares is, um, you know, it, it releases its its peak nitrogen releases like six to eight weeks after application. And that's really good to know. So I used to spread a lot of land right at the beginning. And now I realize, no, that's not so good because um, you're losing a lot, you know, a lot of that nitrogen. If, if you wait two months to, or six, even five weeks to put a crop in, then it's peaking at three weeks after that crop went in. And you may, you may the crop may not really need the nitrogen quite yet. And then it's already gone. So Crayers just allows us to be more nimble uh, and it's quick. And so we, we spread it like that. And we have a spreader, uh, Becky's famous photo. I'm embarrassed to say it was a little bit windy that day, <laughs> but you know, we need to get it up. We need to get some fertility on that field. And um, so we put Crayers on at about a ton an acre. Um, and then the other thing we like to do is we side dress with Clamp Co. I love a clamp. These are great side dressers from California, and um, he has a his he has a metering unit inside each of those downspouts that's made for chicken pellets or chicken granulated chicken manure. And so you can really dial it in. And so we'll spread and then certain crops like brassicas and corn. Those are the two main crops that we side dress. And we side dress with crayers mixed with some Chilean. And um, the, oh, the other crop we uh, side dress is uh, Brussels sprouts, but we we use a high uh, potassium. We add a lot of sulfate of potash to this. And I would say that potassium I meant to mention earlier is probably more of a limiting factor for us than nitrogen. <clears throat> that uh, that I think really when we put on potassium, we've had awesome growth and the uh, so when I focus on potassium, we definitely get better results than when I just focus on nitrogen. And one last thing, or another thing about Brussels sprouts, just as an aside, the guy from Bijou was at the Arnold's one day and he said, they like to put potassium on three to one to nitrogen on Brussels sprouts. So Brussels sprouts really respond well to potassium, just an, F, an FYI. Um, but that's, you know, that's the age that we like, their height that we like to try, uh, side dress corn and we side dress about uh, 800 pounds of crayers per acre mixed with, uh, on that acre, we put in about 75 pounds of Chilean nitrate just to give it a little kick. And, it, and you can see the difference. Um, that's the metering unit that the crayers, that the uh, Clamp Co uses. It's really great. Um, there it is. But, and that's also about the size that we cultivate or uh, side dress brassicas. And when it works well, the crops look like that and like that. And then <clears throat> when it doesn't work well or we miss spots, that's what crops look like. So this is just an interesting, I have a couple slides that just show the difference in fertility in a field that, um, so on the right there, my cat's coming and screaming at me, sorry. On the right there is good fertility at the, on the left, is the end of the field where we ran out of fertilizer and um, 
and you can see, you know, it just was really low. Stop it. It was just really low um, fertility and you can see the results. And also this is another example. This is the same field of, of zucchini. And um, this was, I remember I was spreading this field and, and one, like a quarter of the field towards one end, um, I'd run out of on our second, our fertilizer hopper. You can only get, you have to do two passes to get the right amount per acre on that big spreader with, with the crares because it's so light. And uh, I ran out and I never went back to it. And that's the difference between the, that was those photos were taken on the same day, like in June 20th or something. And that's the difference in, in fertility and non-fertility. Um, but we try and grow stuff so that our farm stand looks like that. And I think that's it. I mean, I could keep going with other slides, but that's another, another talk, so thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think we could all listen to each of you for an hour and a half if we had um, <laughs> didn't have seeds to start and other things to do or cats to feed, but um, thank you so much. And Ryan from Evening Song is gonna, we're gonna switch over into a little bit of talk about tillage and mulching. So uh, Ryan, do you wanna try sharing your slides? Uh, thanks, Becky. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. I'll try to move uh, quickly so I can get all my information in. Uh, my wife, Karen, and I run Evening Song Farm. And um, uh, so I'm gonna be talking about a no-till uh, trial on our farm that we did this year. We did it at a small scale at one tenth of an acre. I think uh, the method that we did has does have a lot of potential to be uh, fairly scale neutral. And um, I think there's a lot of possibility for doing this at a larger scale too. Um, so we did a tenth of an acre this year. Next year, we're gonna be trying it at half an acre. It was um, the trial that we did, the basics of it was growing rye and vetch to maturity and then rolling it down, tarping it with um, a clear tarp and then planting right through the residue. And um, we have, we've heard of a lot of other uh, research and farms that are doing this that kind of inspired us. So it was new on, on our farm, but um, we learned about this, I think first through Natalie Lounsbury of the UNH Extension, and then also uh, Cedar Circle Farm um, and some other farms that, uh, that are doing this. Um, so this is a picture of uh, potatoes grown on our farm. I think this was, uh, you know, maybe on our Facebook page or something, because uh, it looked so good. But the next slide is what these look like, maybe about ten or. 10. And so you can see the brown water running off of this field. This is at about a four or five percent slope. And so, this is one of the big reasons why we wanted to try the uh, growing meth, the um, high residue no-till planting, um, just because. On our farm with a little bit of a slope, it's so important, or it's so urgent for us to think about everything we can do to manage uh, erosion on our farm, um, even when, uh, you know, most of the time we're looking at, we hope to be looking at fields that look like this. Um, the reality is that uh, fields like that uh, turn into fields like this when we get the rains that, the heavy rains that we do. Um, and then uh, this picture on the right is the same field at the same time. This is a higher residue situation where we had grown rye. This photograph is in early July, so we had mowed that rye off. And then on these beds, we probably ran a rototiller over it and then chisel plowed it. Um, and so there's still a lot of residue in there and uh, really very little runoff and, and certainly no um, uh, you know, brown uh, soil. Uh, coming off brown water running off of that field. So we wanted to try, you know, to do as much as we can with high residue plantings. The problem with what we were doing here is that um, it was just so tillage intensive and the way that we had been managing our farm just involved mixing our soil so much uh, with a rototiller and, um, you know, different plowing and all sorts of different implements that mix up the soil. And so this photograph here is what our soil looks like that we hadn't done anything with. This is just some uh, perennial pasture. When we started growing on this land in 2012, it had just been a field that was brush hogged for the last 30 years. And so it had really excellent soil structure to begin with. 
And then as we began, as we kept growing on here from 2012 through 2017, 2018, we saw that soil structure just break down more and more. And we had more, we experienced more problems from um, the tillage practices that we were doing. Um, and then this, I, uh, I looked through all my photos and I guess I just don't take pictures of our fields when they get weedy. So this is uh, someone else's, but um, this, the other problem that we had, I think from mixing all that soil is just uh, that those conditions really allowed weeds to proliferate. And the first few years when we grew on this land coming off of a brush hogged field, it was really nice to not to have very little annual weed pressure from summer annual grasses and um, summer annual broadleafs. And, uh, and that just, that has gotten more and more over time. Um, so that led us to wanting to adapt our growing practices to see if we could uh, keep weed pressure down in part by stirring up our soil a lot less. So this experiment that we did, this is a photograph that our, our three-year-old really loved walking through the tall Ryan vetch in early June. It's about six feet tall right here. We seeded it the previous fall and there wasn't a whole lot of vetch in it. I, I recall that um, there was poor germination of the rye originally, so I had to reseed rye, uh, broadcast it, and incorporate it. And so the vetch that I originally seeded, um, some of it survived, but it was not a thick stand of vetch. It was mostly rye. And then just a few days later, the, there's a grass uh, swale um, in the center of this photo. The photograph on the left, it, um, I did all this with the flail mower. I wonder if I'm coming through. It says I might be having a connectivity issue. Um, You're breaking up a little, so maybe turn your video off if that's okay. So um, hopefully this will be better. So the photograph on the left is where with a flail mower, I, I drove our tr tractor over that field with the three point hitch down and the PTO off just to roll that rye um, in the same direction down to the ground. And then the photograph on the right is um, what we have normally done with rye, where we mow it with our flail mower. Um, so the one on the left is, is the experiment that we were doing. So on the left is where we rolled it, on the right is where it's mowed. And then this slide here, there's the mowed rye to the right uh, just a few days later. And then on the left is where we have it tarped with an old piece of greenhouse plastic to kill the rye and vetch. This is what it looked like um, uh, just a, a couple days after tarping. It really uh, thoroughly, no chance of any regrowth on the rye or vetch. Uh, we, you know, it was really hot uh, this past June, so um, we might have to wait a little longer if we had cloudy conditions. And then in this photograph on July 10th, this is um, me getting cold feet uh, with this experiment because I, I just saw that there were some summer annual grasses that were that had germinated with the rye before rolling it down and so those survived the tarping and I was worried about those overtaking the planting so I ended up using an opaque tarp that we had to cover the whole area for about two weeks from June 20th uh, through July 10th. I guess that's closer to three weeks. And then this photograph on July 10th is when is where we tra we um, transplanted broccoli into the stubble um, after being clear tarped and then uh, again tarped with a uh, with an opaque tarp. So it was marathon broccoli that we seeded June 15th and transplanted on July 10th, and we also spread 250 pounds of 543 um, that we did not incorporate. Um, this is about a tenth of an acre uh, or more or less. So it worked out to 2,200 pounds per acre of that. Um, I didn't really know what to apply. There wasn't a lot of vetch in there. And so I um, mostly wanted to try to avoid a uh, fertility shortage. So, oh, I should go back. The issue, the real issue with this system for us in this experiment is the extra labor involved in transplanting these. And so what we did was kind of marked out the rows with a string uh, we set our first row really precisely with the inner row spacing that we wanted and then um, eyeballed it off of that first row for subsequent 
for the, the next rows to get all the plants at the right spacing. It, it, we ended up, the, what worked the best for us was to use a pitchfork to loosen the soil a little bit. And then someone followed behind and stuck a transplant in there. But it really did take a long time to do this. And that would be um, important to address, to scale it up. I did reach out after this to um, Natalie Lounsbury from um, University of New Hampshire, who did some research on this, this type of um, production method. She recommended this forestry dibble uh, that she used in her plot. And I think that might work a little better because you can just stick it right in the soil. And, um, and she said a 72 plug pretty much fits right in there. So we did purchase one of these and I'm looking forward to trying that uh, to see how, see if that works a little bit faster. And then three weeks after transplanting on July 31st, the uh, broccoli really shot off. And um, you can see in the bottom right, there's a little dandelion there, but really uh, very little weed pressure that's, that's coming up um, this early on. And then also on the far right and on the far left, there's a, our second planting of broccoli uh, that we planted in those beds a couple of weeks later. So August 21st, this is what the residue looks like and the, the weed pressure. Mostly what we have is a few perennial weeds um, in here, um, but really almost nothing that came up as far as annual weeds. And you can see in the broccoli plants in the foreground, there's even some bare soil there um, where you can see the soil through the residue. And um, it was really neat to see that that area didn't fill up with annual weeds. Uh, we had grown onions in this field the year before. And there was, you know, onions are a tough, difficult crop for us to keep clean and it was pretty weedy. And so I was um, really surprised to see the, um, the, the weed suppression that we got even when the mulch was thin. Uh, we'll see if this video will work. Um, I apologize for my videography um, early September and we'll, we'll see if it is uh, good enough to, to play the whole thing. So there's a few, there's a little bit of sow thistle that came up in there, but um, this was before we hadn't done any weeding in this field. So the, what you're seeing is the weeds that came up in the system. There's a, a dock plant, a perennial that uh, survived. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. Here it is. So is this, um, this is an interesting comparison. You, if you look at the ride debris here, you can see that this was a little corner that got mowed instead of rolled. Uh, is the slide coming up? You look uh, confused, Becky. Is this? Yeah, no. That can you see good. what I have going on here? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so this was a little accidental experiment. The clear tarp that I that I put on had a corner cut out of it. So there was, you know, maybe a hundred square feet or a small area that, that wasn't able to get uh, killed with the clear tarp. And so I ended up just running the mower over that so that the vetch didn't take over and go to seed. Um, so there was this little corner that we did the same um, no-till planting, but we mowed the debris instead of rolling it. And I was just fascinated to see how many weeds came up in that mowed area. Um, so, you know, maybe the flail mower scraped the ground a little bit, but for whatever reason, it, we in that little zone, there was um, noticeably uh, more, much more weed pressure than just the rolled area. And then in late September, October, well, we had a, a great harvest of broccoli and um, this what the field here I don't we didn't pick a single weed from the field um, so it was just so encouraging to see how good the suppression was um, and the yield of broccoli was um, uh, was what we would have what we expect and um, it was it was really cool to see it work as well as it did for us in this little experiment so oh, the other thing is um, Becky came and did a PSNT at the end, towards the end of the season. So in mid-September, there was 12 parts per million nitrate, uh, which Becky told me was, um, was low. Uh, the growth on the broccoli was, was really good. It, I don't think that nitrogen was a limiting factor, but it was neat to see that um, in the, with what we did, that there was not a lot of nitrogen available at the end of the season to leach into the surface water, groundwater. So then this is, um, this year we're 
looking to grow a few more um, to expand on this. Uh, this is, we're trying some different things as far as establishing our cover crop. This is rye and vetch um, broadcast like we did for the previous experiment. Um, we also, in our little tenth of an acre blocks, this is uh, rye and vetch that were um, drilled with a push seeder. And then we're also trying broadcasting rye, but drilling the vetch uh, right on the beds um, in this picture. So we'll see if, if any of those make any difference or if we have any preferences for those, the cover, cover crop establishment methods. And then um, in 2021, the crops that we are planning to do with this, in addition to fall broccoli, are Brussels sprouts, fall cabbage, uh, final, our last succession of zucchini and cucumbers, and then fall kale and Napa cabbage that will be planted the latest. We're going to do the same system, but trying to grow sweet. We have a sweet clover cover crop that will let grow to maturity and roll that to try growing fall kale and Napa cabbage like in this photo. This picture here is, um, we grew these plants last year and mulched it with some seedy rye uh, baled straw. And um, it was neat to see the rye that got established under there and the kale and Napa cabbage outcompeted it. So that was kind of a cool thing. And it gives us the idea to um, try also broadcasting some uh, clover seed into the rye right before it's rolled to see if we can establish clover under there, um, like Silas was talking about. And then um, another way that we might try tinkering with the system is to try for some earlier planted crops to try uh, killing that rye and vetch a little bit earlier. And then um, the mulch will be thinner. So uh, applying a little bit of straw mulch on top of that. And then um, last idea for how, how we might tinker with this is growing Sudan grass in the summer, rolling it down after the frost and try, try using that area for an earlier summer planting. And uh, that's, that's what I have for this. Thanks, Ryan. That looks amazing. Um, excited to see how this year goes for you. Um, if you don't mind addressing questions in the chat and we can move on to Spencer and if we have time at the end, we can talk, but I wanna give him um, his 20 minutes. So that's okay with you. Spencer, do you wanna try sharing your screen? Okay. Okay, um, I'm Spencer Blackwell. I run Elmer Farm in Middlebury, Vermont. We're a 10 acre vegetable, diversified vegetable farm for local market CSA and local wholesale. Um, we, um, yeah, 40 different vegetable crops. Um, so the, the, I am, you know, very much in awe of this program that Ryan was just starting to discuss here of no-till and reduced till and mulching. It's really amazing in terms of, um, you know, reducing my fertility implement, uh, in, uh, inputs and my labor inputs in terms of weeding. There's um, in a lot of instances that come to having no weeding at all and um, being able to build fertility without importing um, materials from industrial, well, at least, you know, chicken farms. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, we do, we've done a lot of mulching and mulching is kind of the uh, basis for our system. Um, but basically the theory is that we're going to, instead of um, tilling the soil and breaking and making that fluffy habitat for a burst of um, energy release to our vegetables, we are going to build uh, habitat on top of our soil and keep that, uh, build that, um, so that release of energy kind of is constantly happening as that material decomposes from the bottom side, um, which is going to facilitate more fungal life, more microorganisms, and all that good stuff that we've heard about, um, but nobody really has figured out how to do on large scale. Um, so we're trying to do that. Um, it, the, so right, that's uh, just an example of some a picture there, of some carrots that we experimented with growing without weeding, without mechanical weeding this year. 
um, and that's some fungal growth growing on there. And what I think is happens when you do uh, what the, my uh, hope is that what will happen is that we'll have, we won't have the collapse that you have after tillage. So uh, we have great growth after fresh after tillage and especially if you fertilize it appropriately, everything grows really well generally, but then you have a collapse and that collapse isn't always when your crop is done growing and you get, that's when the weeds and disease and everything just runs, wreaks havoc. Um, so we are using a lot of mulch to um, work, work the system. Um, mulch, uh, primarily we're using um, split, split silage, but we use uh, rye mulch. And even within spoilt silage, there's is there's like various different. Is it was it dairy silage or was it like yeah young stock silage or you know how much nutrient was in that silage to begin with and how dry and um, carbonish is it is going to make a big impact into how it's going to perform for you. Um, also, how long has it been rotting? You know. Whole bunch of different characteristics. I would ideally, I would have, and I do to some extent, have all my mulch piles categorized into different uh, places, and I use a different pile for different applications. Um, those are some of the characteristics there that we uh, that I, that I uh, you know run through in terms of when and how to use it. Um, including the, the using the mulch in place, like Ryan's system there was showing where you grow it and you, and you have it right there. Um, to start all this out, um, you really, a no-till is somewhat a misnomer in that you have to, like I have found that in order to manage this at any scale, and we're doing, we probably had an acre or two of uh, technically, no, I don't know if it's technically or not, but no-till, we didn't till it this year beds, um, but we tilled the hell out of them to get them to a place where we could do that. So the shape is critical um, to matching all your tools. If you want your mower to kill every weed and to mow everything to just the mulch, to the, your live mulch into just the right size, you have to have your ground, you can't have, you can't have dips and hollows and weird stuff in your soil. So I found that shape is critical to this. Um, and um, I also, what is kind of nice about this system is that you set up this, this um, shape of your soil and you, it lasts for years if it's not messed up. Um, so you kind of have the opportunity to do this at the optimal time. It's not like you have to do it because you got to get the crop in tomorrow. It's you do it when the, when the, when the weather is best. And, and I find that midsummer, July, uh, late July, early August is really the best time. The soil is driest. You're going to do the least amount of damage to it. Um, you make everything perfect and you get something seeded immediately so that it doesn't even matter what it is. I throw all kinds of stuff on just to get something growing. Um, and sometimes in, in this picture, on um, whatever side it is with the crop growing or the cover crop growing on the beds, that is, um, those beds, I spread. Uh, I spread some mulch on top. I, like I seeded the, the cover crop, and then I spread a thin layer of mulch, kind of like you would see uh, um, a landscaper seeding somebody's lawn. Just keep that soil covered, keep that uh, biology um, alive, and get those plants to germinate in, as quickly and evenly as possible. Um, it's a little. The system is is a little tough because not it, it's you've got it's precise you can't just you're not just cleaning a field flat you have to be a good tractor operator and you built these these uh compaction zones that you're 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 kind of bouncing on almost like railroad tracks when you're driving if this if it's wet or if you're not in great you're not going to be compacting your growing area unless you don't know how to drive really well um and a picture on what the the, the other side there has a uh, where um, somebody didn't know how to use the steering brakes to stay on top when they were trying to lift uh, parsnips. And they just fell into the beds and those beds are messed up. I mean, the, I got to till the heck out of those beds just to get that thing back into a shape that can work. So that's like what would have lasted for years is now done. Um, 
uh, so that that makes the system somewhat limited in terms of um, you know who your employees can be. Um, cover crops are the basis for the system for feeding the nutrients. Um, you know, the mulch provides a lot of nutrient, but the the live growing plants is the basis for that. Um, and if you are not I, find, I, I don't know, this is all anecdotal, but if, if, if you're not tilling those mulches or those cover crops in, I feel like the benefits may be uh, greater. You don't, they don't burn up quite as quickly. The release of them is more sustained um, from what I can tell. Um, maybe Becky could tell me someday for real. Um, so another, um, so that's just some clover and rye. I really like the doing um, red clover under rye and then let the red clover go for a year or two and mow it to just um, for a long-term cover crop. Um, and then, uh, you know, terminating those crops is I, I prefer mowing to disking or tilling them because I'm keeping all that stuff on the surface I'm letting, like if I, if I were to have um, plowed in or dissed in any of this rye, it takes, a, a, like if you let a rye crop grow to six feet tall and, and terminate it right before it goes to flower, you have so much biomass there that if you put all that into your soil, you're gonna, you're gonna suck up every last bit of nitrogen just to try to eat that rye up. And it takes a long time to um, have that soil ready to produce anything again. Um, when it does eat that up, then it's great, but it, it's, it's not an immediate turnaround. Whereas if you leave it on the surface, you can get an immediate turnaround. Um, those are some radishes, or no, that's buckwheat. Buckwheat um, tilled into, or uh, drilled into some rye. And then the, um, also the other thing I noticed is I used to spend forever trying to mow up these giant rye crops just crawling along, binding up the mower and then, one day I was like, why don't I just mow it a foot tall? It'll look like a trashy mess, but it's gonna kill all the seed, it's gonna knock all the seeds back, seed heads off. And it's still gonna let the clover come up underneath. It, it, it provides the soil coverage. And then I can mow it five or six miles an hour. And then I come back in a, another month and mow it again if I want to. But either way, I'm spending a lot less time than crawling along at, 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 at half a mile an hour chewing up rye. Um, so I like that. Um, here is some yellow blossom sweet clover. It's a cro cover crop I've loved, but I have a really hard time establishing a, like this. This was, um, I, I get a lot of weeds that grow in it in the first year. In the second year, if, if it um, comes in thick enough, you can get something like this. Um, mowing that um, uh, with a flail mower um, to provide that surface mulch there um, proved to be incredibly effective at growing a crop with uh, no tillage, no tillage that season anyways, and no uh, added fertilizer. Um, another cover crop combo is for the winter, oats, radish, peas, works really well. Um, this uh, picture of the desiccated is just shows you how, how thoroughly it gets killed. But it, this was taken before I started um, making my beds before. I highly recommend, even if you are gonna till, make your beds before you plant the winter killed crop. And then your, your tillage in the spring can be uh, very light. You don't have to shape beds. You can just kind of uh, scratch the surface when the soils are real wet in the spring. Um, another thing I've found is that mowing that um, in the fall, right? Like it, you got to mow it before it collapses from the frost because otherwise the mower doesn't grab it. But um, that way those particles are going to be a lot smaller in the spring and easier to manage. Um, you kind of potentially lose out on some growth um, if you end up with a long, um, uh, long fall. Uh, but that was you know, Halloween-ish getting mowed. And I think we were uh, frozen out not too long after. Um, uh oh, what, why did I do that? Oh no, go, it won't advance. There we go. 
Um, so after the um, the cover crops have been terminated, like Ryan did, this is like magic. You put these tarps on, if you got a sunny degree, 75 degree day plus, um, it, they just work like magic one day and you've killed everything under there. Um, it, 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 like, uh, within reason, you're not gonna kill like dock and you know giant dandelions and stuff, but any, any annual weeds, any young just germinating grasses, they're gonna be done. Um, some tips, just make sure that like we, we did that in the dry period and all of a sudden it wasn't working anymore. Why not? It's because it's that the moisture under there is what's, it's actually like almost steaming that to get the heat. So if um, when it was dry, we started irrigating prior to the uh, putting the plastic on just to make sure it was wet enough under there to, to do that, seal up the edges, um, make sure there's no, you know, tall things poking the plastic up, creating little, uh, little, uh, you know, whatever canopies that will make it a little cooler. So everything's mowed down and um, it works really well. Um, those are some examples of stuff that have been um, tarped and you can see you can plant right in there. Um, you know, I have never had arugula without a single weed that you could just go along and cut it without even looking at what you're doing. Um, the, and the other thing that's really nice is that if it's too wet to plant, you don't have to put a tractor through there. That day, I don't think we even used the water wheel. It was so wet, or maybe, maybe we did. I don't know, those lines are awfully straight. We probably did. Um, uh, black plastic mulch um, is an, or black plastic um, is another way of killing a cover crop. So you're not going to kill a perennial uh, very well with the, well, at least I don't think you are. I haven't tried it, to be honest. Uh, you're not going to kill like a red clover with. Um, the clear plastic, um, and I say that, I, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe you could, maybe someone should try that. Um, but uh, I didn't think I could kill red clover with clear plastic. So I used um, black plastic or uh, yeah, like a silage tarp, um, which I didn't have a picture of. So I drew one for you. Um, on this, this is clover that has been um, in, those were beds that I, I seeded clover over, um, uh, where I frost seeded clover where I had taken carrots out in 2017, um, mowed it for 2018, 2019, and 2020, I did this. After the first cut of clover, we put the black plat or the silage tarp on there for a month. Um, so let's see, it probably was the month of June. Um, and then there was still like, so we pulled that off. There was still some nuts edge and dandelions and stuff that looked like they had some viability. So I spread mulch on top of that um, just to kind of uh, smother out anything. And I left the, left the strips open to plant into. So um, uh, just to make the plant, in, so I don't have to plant through the mulch. The mulch can be kind of yucky to touch. Um, the silage, the rotted silage. So the crew doesn't really like that. Um, there's various different ways of handling the mulch. Um, I have this, this um, chuck wagon, which works great for kind of a very crude delivery of a lot at once. Um, it, uh, it's great for doing the edges of plastic. It's great for mul um, throwing out mulch onto like a full size chard or kale plant if I want to mulch underneath them. Um, but it takes a little bit of handwork to get under the plants. Um, and, um, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it, it takes the, in order to get a nice even flow, like you see along that plastic, you really have to have uh, a nice mulch. It's not too clumpy. Like if it, the rotten silage sits too long, it clumps up and it, it won't pop out of there long. Or if it's fresh chopped green stuff, that is, um, you know, not chopped finely enough. It'll clump up and, and it won't flow out of there. Flow is um, really important to mechanizing all this. So the, the size of the particles of that um, mulch is great. And my neighbors are dairy farmers and they have, uh, you know, 300 horsepower chopper that chops like amazing amounts of grass into two inch pieces. 
in very quickly. And they also grow so much of it that they have a lot of waste and that they don't mind giving me. Or and I've actually started buying it because it's, it's really valuable. Um, it's much more affordable than crayers um, in terms of its benefits to my farm anyways, uh, in because it, it, it has a lot of nutrient in it. It's, that it's made to make milk. Um, and so it's high nutrient grass and it, uh, it also has the weed benefits. Um, so in order to get a little more precision with that, I, I built this um, shields for my box spreader. Um, and that is another thing that is just amazing, like magic. We get able all of a sudden to mulch on top of crops that are already established without any handwork. Um, the, uh, this again, this, these are fairly weed free there. And that's a result of though that it's, it's um, more or less conventional tillage than uh, we had, you know, a crop or two before these beets that we, um, we solarized in between. And so there was perhaps lettuce growing there, maybe radishes before we seeded the beets, but we solarized that and that kills like a large percentage of those weeds. Um, which also allows you to, to use mulch without um, needing to feel like you can't mechanically cultivate. Um, though I have been able to mechanically cultivate with a basket weeder right on top of the mulch because it's chopped so fine, it doesn't bind up in the, in the baskets. Um, it works so well on that. Previous crop of beets, I said, well, I don't even need to bother. And I, so I spread, uh, worrying about cultivation. So I spread the mulch first and then seeded the beet, or I, set, I seeded the beets and then spread the mulch on top, let the beets come right up through. And this was an incredibly dry season, you know, and not able to get the irrigation here, the beets still came right up. And I attribute that 100% to having that moisture retention due to the mulch. Um, uh, carrots. Same thing. Um, I was a little more nervous about carrots because they're a huge crop for us and I didn't want to, uh, it's something you can spend a lot of time weeding. So I spread the mulch in strips, seeded, I uh, pushed the seeder right through the strips on two beds of 20 or so. And just to see how it would do in a side-by-side -side comparison. And it was, pretty nice it, i mean the weeding there was weeds we still i mean we hand weed all our carrots we hand weeded these mulched ones too more pulling dandelions out than pulling um lamb's quarters ragweed kind of things that was less germinated but these, these beds were conventionally tilled beforehand so there was that, that fresh flush of weeds right on the surface um, the, so we weeded them a little bit less than with the, the, the ones next door that didn't get any mulch. But what was most notable in the dry season was that they germinated faster and with so much more vigor than the ones next to them. Um, and the, the, the drawback though, was that I fertilized the whole block um, with my you know, conventional uh, crayers and um, sopal mag. Um, fertilizer regime for carrots. And what happened was that mulch contributed, I believe, I'm guessing that mulch contributed too much nitrogen to those carrots. And they, I got a lot more forked and knobbed carrots out of those beds. So I will have to, if I do that more, I'll have to figure out how to dial back the nitrogen inputs. Um, I've that the you know you can get the, it can be harsh on transplants or young seedlings. Um, the, the mulch is, is hot, you know, it's like, you know, hundred steaming, steaming, hundred degree plus steaming piles of rotten silage and, um, on a hot sunny day, which this was where I spread them on my parsnips. Um, it was, uh, too much for them and it killed like anything that wasn't a super vigorous plant to start with got burned by them and died on the parsnips. Um, the, on that parsnip picture there, the mulch has all been pushed into the row by hand. That's why it looks so evenly, but they, it was laid out more like the, on the parsley where there was a strip of, of uh, dirt between. Um, 
the parsley was, I mean, and most things uh, uh, that have gotten burned, the parsley is totally grew out of it. Brassicas can gr have grown out of it. Um, they, they, it is a little scary when you first put that on and it burns your plants. Um, and that's why I've kind of gone towards putting the mulch down first and then planting through it um, in, through, into those strips. Um, all right, this is a different, uh, this is that back to that field that I had um, killed with the, the clover that I had killed with the plastic, the silage tarp. Um, this is like, like Ryan did, we stuck those broccoli plants right in to the residue. Um, the drip uh, with the, put down with the sandbags was a revelation this season. We we had had we had, had buried drip before. I had done all kinds of things to try to keep the drip from blowing away without having black plastic on top of the drip, um, and it, it worked really well. Just hold it down with sandbags. Um, the uh, the stuff was really hard to transplant. Um, I think that that tool that Ryan said could be a good way to go if on kind of a smaller scale, I think on a larger scale, you, if you were gonna to try to do like a water wheel type thing, you would need to have an, like a no-till, a little bit of a ripper slicer thing to cut open a slot through that. Because particularly on this clover that hadn't been mowed for, or hadn't been just been, had just been mowed for years, the ground is really hard. Um, it, it did not want to take transplants and, or, and uh, it was, uh, there was lots of protests by my transplanters, including myself, um, with our hurt fingers. Um, but after the transplanting happened, we didn't do anything else. And we got this. Um, and if it weren't for the Swede midge, we would be uh, sold on growing broccoli this way forever. And, and because of the Swede midge, I don't think I'm ever going to grow broccoli again. Um, but yeah, best Napa cabbage crop I've had in ages. The fennel's gorgeous, and we didn't weed it. Um, you know, or I should say, we didn't weed it for more than ten minutes on that tenth of an acre. Um, there, you know, a couple big things that we yanked out here and there. Um, some other things I'm trying, I, um, uh, onions, we normally grow overwintered onions and we do them into um, black plastic. i tired of using black plastic, disposable black plastic. I'm gonna try to reduce my use of that. So um, here we're transplanting right into some chopped up oats and peas and radish um, in October, mulching it to kind of smother and make a little breathing room for the onions. Um, but those radish in particular have a lot of vigor and um, hopefully the onion, they'll die because we covered them all up with uh, you know protection for the winter. So hopefully it doesn't protect the radish enough to let them grow through the winter too. Otherwise I won't have any onions in that bed. Um, another no-till experiment here. This is winter rye that had gotten huge. Um, and this was uh, two years ago where it was incredibly wet in the spring. And um, we had, had chopped off the rye to use for mulch somewhere else. Um, I had winter, I had uh, undersowed that whole block with clover and I was planning on not using it for um, a few years. Uh, I didn't have any space to put some corn. So I was like, all right, let's try to stick it right in this rye here. So I spread mulch on there really heavy to try to kill back the, any regrowth and clover um, competition. Um, stuck the transplants in again, not the easiest thing to transplant, but, but doable. I think I did run some rippers through here to open a little slot to help transplant that. Um, and then the clover came back anyways, um, right through all that mulch, the clover just burst right up through. And, um, I wasn't sure that things would work, but they did. We had a great corn crop and, uh, I think some of that is that the, the, the grass, the, the corn is the grass and the, and the clover is a legume and that they're good companions. They help each other along. You can see there were some weeds along that slot that we ripped. Uh, you can see some, rag, I can see some ragweed in the corn row there. It was, um, I think that was a result of having turned up some clumps when we uh, put the corn in. Um, 
sometime, this is mulch that was put down in 2019 and then we grew kale or cabbage in it. And then uh, in the spring, we just planted right back into it again um, with celeriac and celery. Um, it was, yeah, a twofer there. We got the got two uses out of that mulch and that tillage and I didn't add any fertilizer to any of the crops. Um, and had a, a, probably the best celery celeriac I've ever grown. Um, that's it. Thanks, Spencer. That was inspiring. Um, I'm ready to go try all sorts of new things right now. Um, I know we're over 10 o'clock. Um, I'm happy to stick around for questions. I don't know if Spencer, you have a few minutes for verbal questions um, or how, how you're feeling, but um, they, I'm, I'm good, I can stay. Okay. Um, there's actually one for you in the chat, um, or a couple for you actually. Um, do you need to make sure that hay mulch you buy has not grown too long to have weed seed in it? Um, I, I'm, beggars can't be choosers, so I get whatever they bring me. I don't really know what, how long it grew or, or what. They, they manage their fields pretty well. They do three, four cuts a year. Um, and I, I, I was shocked. I didn't, when they first started bringing in, I was really hesitant about what I put it on. Nothing grew, nothing grew out of it. So I've been, been more and more liberal with putting it on anywhere. Uh, maybe someday I'll get burned by that, but so far so good. I think that the, the silage process kill, maybe, it, it, I mean, those piles come are, at, at some point, I think maybe the, the piles might get hot enough to kill a lot of the seeds. Great. Um and then what are you using to seed your carrots and beets with? Um, yang, push seeder. Cool, I think, let me see what's down here. Um, um, for the corn, I was a little confused. Did you use tarp killing for the fall, rye, clover in the spring before seeding or transplanting the corn? No tarps. We just mowed the, the rye off and the clover was still alive there. You couldn't really see it because it was very small still. And then the clover grew in around the corn? Yep. Cool. And are you concerned about GMO with the mulch? It's hay. It's hay mulch. Occasionally I'll get like a touch of corn that was they probably scraped off the bunk flat, you know, but it's they're they're sending me just hay. Cool. And where is the narrow opaque tarp from, not the silage tarp? Uh, it's a greenhouse plastic that we had sliced into a narrow strip. The opaque one? Oh, oh the opaque is a silage tarp. Okay. Just slice oh. to fit. Where's the narrow? Uh, the narrow clear, the narrow one I think was maybe a clear tarp, which I had was greenhouse plastic. And uh, the other was a silage tarp. Um, I think that's it for you. If anyone wants to pipe up, um, otherwise we can sign off. And um, I put the link to the evaluation in the chat. I can pop it in there again. And I'll also email everybody after the fourth meeting with it. Um, and hopefully you can fill it out and be in touch if you have any questions. Thank okay. you all. Thanks um, to all the awesome presenters. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.